Welcome to Moving Data from Oracle to Postgres in Near Real Time. Today we're going to talk about the importance of extremely scalable data ingestion, why real-time data transformations are critical, why complexity is no longer acceptable, and how to radically simplify data ingestion. My name is Lindsay Hooper. I'm one of the Postgres conference organizer, and I will be your moderator for this webinar. I'm here with Alton Dinsmore, who's a senior data architect at Aqualum. Alton is a data veteran, having worked at Oracle, Dell, EMC, MariaDB, and more. He has 40 years plus of design and architect experience around enterprise data solutions and applications. He's helped many companies implement successful projects around large data, uh, high performance, large number of users, large number of transactions and clustering, as well as high availability and disaster recovery. I wanna say welcome to Alton. With that, I'm gonna hand it off to Alton. Take it away. Thank you, Lindsay, and uh, thank you everyone for joining us today. Uh, today, what we wanna do is talk about moving data from Oracle to Postgres in near real time. Uh, so what we'll do is I'll give myself a little introduction. Lindsay's already covered a lot of it. Uh, and then we'll talk about some of the challenges, what our platform brings to the table for you, uh, what we do with our Connect, our universal change data capture that we use, and some customer use cases, and then we'll go into the live demo. And we'll try not to keep it too salesy and uh, keep it very technical. As Lindsay pointed out, I've been doing this for over 40 years. I've uh, worked at many companies, Oracle included, uh, with Rack, doing a lot around Rack over the years and all. Uh, but many mainframe databases even before Oracle came on the scene. Uh, and I've you know, led projects, engineering teams, design teams, uh, done just about anything in the world you can think about when it comes to putting things together. And um, some of the things I've really uh, uh, had to do in my past experience is uh, work on resolving very large database implementation and issues around it as well as high number of users, you know, when you start getting into, uh, in the early days, it was hard to get more than 2,500 concurrent users running on Oracle. And, uh, you know, worked on those uh, 4,000 plus and larger uh, implementations. So, you know, why, why Qualum? Why are we here today? Who are we? Uh, well, basically, a qualum was started by a bunch of data enthusiasts, right? So our founder and everybody uh, are ex-DBAs, ex-data scientists, data architects, developers, all around the data side of the house. And the real thing that was very noticeable that uh, our founder saw was uh, the ability to liberate data. Uh, sure, you can get to the data, but it wasn't real easy. And um, with the qualum, he came up with a way to make the data ingestion process very, very simple. And to be honest, that's the same thing that drug me over here is, is how simple it is to, to actually get to the data and make it available for, for usage uh, outside of the operational data stores. And the reason for that is, is um, as we get in and we start looking at the challenges and anybody who's ever worked in a very large organization uh, knows this, the uh, challenges, some of the challenges we face, not all of them, needless to say is, is uh, when you have these massive amounts of data being collected real time, and then people say, oh, well, I wanna, I wanna pull those and I wanna put them into a data warehouse and then I wanna be able to run analytics on them or, AI or ML or whatever in the world you want to call it these days, um, it, it's, it's very, very tough to move large amounts of data real time. And trying to roll it on your own is a very expensive proposition, requires a lot of skill sets. And uh, uh, it's, just, it's just time consuming and very chaotic in a lot of cases. Then of course comes the challenge of, you know, well, the data's good over there, but I need to transform it because I don't want to transform it after it gets into the data warehouse because it's too, it's too much a problem for the analytics tools. I want to basically denormalize the data that I normalize for my uh, operational data stores. I'm going to denormalize it so things run faster and quicker and it's more accessible and understandable on the other side. So doing that data cleansing and data transformation is also a real, real process uh, 
a problem for people when they have these large amounts of data coming from many, many data sources. And then if when you get to the operational side of it, that's where it really gets to be a problem. Automating it, managing it, monitoring it, all the restart procedures, uh, all the stuff that people normally do after the fact. I don't know in my career how many times I've seen people roll systems into production without even a backup. Uh, and so these are the kind of things that wind up coming at the tail end of the project that people don't really plan for in a lot of cases. But if you're going to run it on a daily basis and it's going to be part of the infrastructure, all those things have to be put into place. And then when you get to the, uh, the last one there, really trying to enable all those in an enterprise grade type platform with no coding required like uh, Qualum has done is really, really tough. And uh, that was the whole goal of, of building a Qualum is doing this in an enterprise grade with no coding being required. When you look at a Qualum, uh, it's pretty straightforward. We look at things from uh, a very simplistic format to me the sources being on the left and targets being on the right. And the business problem is I have data that's sitting in operational data stores and cloud services, application, file directories, um, I don't care, anywhere, just sitting out there, IoT sensors. And what I need to do is I need to get it to a target. And the most common target that people are usually going to think about is, is I want to put it in a data lake or a data warehouse. Uh, because data lakes and data warehouses have been around for a long time, 10 plus years. And so that's the one people think of. But it's not only taking that information and pushing it into a data lake or data warehouse. Uh, you may have some AI or ML applications you want to do. You may also want to take some of that data and put it on the message queue for it to be consumed by another application that's grown in-house. So the way we approach it is, is we have a, a set of connectivity that we uh, call our agents that actually connect to the sources. And those uh, connections, depending on the source, most sources uh, can do change data capture as well as real time streaming of the data. Now, needless to say, it can do batch, but uh, the biggest challenge is, is to do the change data capture and keep the streaming data going. So we talk more about it than we do the batch but uh, the batch is there. And no matter how you set it up, you can just say, instead of running a streaming this time, I want to run it in batch. And we can do that in the demo at any point you want to. Then in the center, before you push it out, you may want to do all your ETL and ELT type work. You may want to do transformations. You may want to filter data. You may want to do different transformations based on the geos that they're coming from. You may want to augment the data. Uh, and enrich the data. So you can do all those kind of things. And then over on the right hand side, what you're going to do is, is you're actually going to push it out to your target. And there's different ways that you can push it out to your target. You can append to the target, which in the case of a data warehouse that needs auditing capabilities, you really don't want to update the record that's there. You want to insert every record as being a new record. And you may want to merge or replicate and things of that nature. And it really doesn't matter where you're going to put it over on the right hand side. And Postgres is definitely one of our major targets over on the right hand side, uh, as well as being a source, but you know, mainly a target. In the, this case, we will be tar talking about target. And then for a Qualum, it really doesn't matter. You can either run it on-prem, you can run it in the cloud, you can run it in the hybrid. All we really need is, is we need the OS to be running. So it can run as a VM, it can run on bare metal. It really doesn't matter. It doesn't matter which VM you put it under. It doesn't matter. It's not going to affect what we're doing with the product. So with the Qualum, uh, what you can do is, is you can capture your changes from your data source, change data capture as it's referred to. Uh, and basically, change data capture is not a single technology. It is basically a philosophy of how you get data as it's changed and how you get that changed data differs based on your source. So for relational databases, we're usually going right directly after the log files in relational databases. But when we're looking at something like an S3 bucket or an NFS share and we're actually bringing in 
say comma separated value files or JSON files or XML files. What you're looking for is you're looking for new files to be dropped or you may be looking for additional rows to be added to the file after you have did your initial capture of the, uh, the data itself. So with uh, Qualum, we can replicate your Oracle data to Postgres very quickly and very easily with very little uh, work involved from your side of the house. And this gives you the ability to take anything that's sitting in Oracle and just push it into Postgres in near real time. Now you can also take and you can replicate your existing po operational Postgres and put it into a Postgres data warehouse if you would like to do that. And it's also very useful and a lot of people do this, taking their data from on-prem because that's where they're running their operational, but they have the data warehouse and data lake setting in the cloud. So there's no problem doing that either. And you can actually even take events from your Postgres database and push them into a message queue, a publish and subscribe type system, whichever one you would like to do. And you can push it to basically any of those publish and subscribe systems for everything, everybody to pick them up from there. And as I said, you can transform, join, enrich, cleanse your data, aggregate your data. It really doesn't matter. You can do all those functions and features without having to write sophisticated code. Uh, all done through the graphical UE and all. And you're going to do that all in real time without the coding effort that people normally have to go through. <clears throat> so if we look at our agent, our connect agent that's doing the change data capture, uh, depending on where you're going and what you're going after, like if you're going after Oracle, you're doing log parsing, log mining, the Oracle redo log is where you're actually getting the information from. In SQL Server, we, we go differently and go after the change data capture information. In MySQL, we, we basically set ourselves up as a read-only slave. In Postgres, we're looking at the wall file, a, a wall file and doing logical decoding on it and so forth and so forth. And then on uh, things, uh, when we get down to the, uh, the individual flat files and all, in those cases, we've written some of our own CDC capabilities. So how do you get to CDC? Well, there's a couple of ways. You know, normally you're not just gonna start with change data capture because change data capture is gonna give you from the point in time that you request change data capture. So normally you're gonna do an initial data load and behind that, we'll follow it with a change data capture synchronization. And some of the nice things about it is, is that we never have to take the source offline or lock the source or anything else. We're just going after grabbing the data, pulling it across. And once the initial load's done, then we start the change data capture synchronization right behind it. There's other things we can do here with multi-table schema, database replication we can do the target table creation for you automatically. We can do DML synchronization. We can manage the schema evolution and you get to choose how you want to do that schema evolution. As well as we've talked about the real-time data transformation, uh, we can write to multiple targets in multiple formats. You can have multiple write behaviors, whether you want to append to the target, whether you want to merge it or whether you want to do a true full replication. Uh, including deletes. Uh, and one of the things that uh, sounds easy, but I think anybody who's ever tried to move from Oracle to Postgres or from one database to another knows that doing the uh, target data type conversion is always uh, a pain for people. It's something that you really have to look at closely. So we do uh, automatic data type conversions. And then of course uh, the user does have the advantage or the ability to go in and modify those data types. So if you don't like the default mapping we gave it, if you want it to be different in the target, that's something that you can set up and change very easily just going through the GUI. And as I said, you know, we have a zero coding user interface, a graphical user interface, which you'll see here in a minute. And then one of the things that a lot of people never talk about is, is the monitoring and alerting. It's built into our platform. We monitor all the different phases, all the different steps, and we have alerting that can be set up so that you can get notified if anything does not fall within the uh, 
areas that you wanted to. So any kind of warnings or any kind of failures, you will get uh, alerts for those. And uh, one of the big things I think uh, when you look at a qualm is, is we have an exactly once guarantee. Uh, a lot of products will guarantee that they'll do the record only once, right? That uh, yeah, they'll get it once, but they won't always guarantee that you get every change always replicated and processed just one time. So some will do the exact once up to the target, but they don't guarantee that you get every row on the uh, change that came in. Others will guarantee that they'll get every change, but sometimes they actually push out multiple records to the target. Coming from, uh, you know, Oracle background, you know, exactly once is exactly what I want. I do not want stock trades uh, being processed or dropped multiple times. So, uh, and along with that, we have a full HA topology. So it doesn't matter what fails, uh, whether it's a source, whether it's target, whether it's one of our components, whether it's the servers, uh, full HA. And with that, a full restart to guarantee only once processing. So it doesn't matter where we fail, you're fully insured that everything will process only once. A uh, little bit on the, because people always want to know, you know, who's working with us, what we've done. So we have a lot of different uh, companies that we work with in different areas. They're not all within just a single one. And we have some real closely working uh, partners. Uh, some examples of some things that have uh, that we've actually done for our customers in the oil and gas. Uh, one of the things that they wanted to do in this company was they really needed to get the IoT sensor information processed very, very quickly. Uh, previously, it was taking uh, 15 minutes or more to get the IoT data. And 15 minutes is a lifetime when you're actually looking at equipment, sending out the pre uh, pre-pending errors, you know, failures are about to occur uh, when you're dealing with this expensive equipment. So getting it in near real time is exactly what people needed to do. So as you can see the pain points here, uh, 10 minutes latency at best, no matter what they did. Uh, and the problem was uh, the whole data ingestion process was very time consuming and uh, they're having more and more sensors added every day. So what we did was we actually took data from a variety of sources, including Oracle SQL Server, DB2, and many others, uh, real time and batch into MemSQL in this case with sub-second uh, latency for the data ingestion part uh, into the system. And that, that really, really uh, improved their whole entire process. So one second or less streaming latency, 20,000 changes per second, and you know, real-time reporting and analytics being performed on this data. And uh, as you can see there, they tested six products and Equalum was the only product able to deliver on both latency and performance. Uh, media, broadcasting, um, what they really wanna do is go in and actually look at how social media uh, is impacting the viewership of their shows. And so it was a, uh, very interesting uh, approach at this, uh, uh, kind of like, uh, you know, they've been doing for years, but this time they need it more real time because as they put it out there, they needed to see the impact. Uh, so ingestion from over 10 different sources, this one's in a Azure SQL data warehouse. Uh, they tried this internally and uh, the problem is, and I think a lot of people find this out once they go down this road, uh, it takes a large skill set, and then the problem you got is is turnover and staff. That skill set leaves, and so it really, really is tough when you try to do it yourself. Um, real time was enabled. They got a unified view of the data, and they, they, we empowered them in a single week. What would have taken them years in house to build? And then um, we got a large manufacturing conglomerate same kind of thing, you know, um, so different customers that they had to process and all, taking a lot of uh, sensor information and data from S3 in real time and batch into Hadoop on AWS, 
16 different data sources, 120 different data manipulation steps. And um, it, it, you know, it took them a lot of time to actually process all this information. And so when they brought us in, what they did was uh, they, they took what they had running uh, currently and moved it over. They saw a 15 times improvement in performance, a 10 times cost reduction, a 300% improvement in productivity, and it was real time and self-service also, which was really important. So if we look under the covers, uh, what you'll see is you'll see uh, a qualum has uh, the sources and targets on the left and right, but in the center, what you'll see is, is the engine itself working with the connect engine. And the connect engine, when we're doing streaming, is going to move the data into a Kafa topic, and then we're going to work and run our own special code setting inside of Spark uh, to do the actual manipulation and the flows. And we use Zookeeper along with HDFS to help guarantee the high availability. This is an example of the, uh, just the GUI UF UI uh, so that people can actually see it. And we'll go into the demo and see it in a, a greater detail. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna go over to the platform and actually look at it. When you come into Equalum, you come into the dashboard, uh, normally on port 9001, and there's two views. There's the replication group view, and there's the classic view. For people who are really just looking at moving large amounts or large number of tables, say from Oracle to Postgres, they would probably use the replication um, method. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna go through that first. What I wanna do is, is I wanna lay out in my experience working uh, for Crunchy and MariaDB, you know, Postgres and uh, uh, MariaDB is my SQL type database. Uh, one of the things that there's two, two main reasons that I saw that people wanted to pull data off of Oracle and get it into Postgres. And um, one of them was they wanted to take the application and modernize it and they wanted to rewrite it so that they could actually move off of Oracle. That's one of them, which replication groups are perfect for that, right? Because I'll need to take the data, I need to push it across, and I need to change data capture to keep the data going while I spend the next six months to a year and a half modernizing the application, rewriting it, maybe even containerizing it and putting it in Kubernetes and get microservices in place in the new release and run it against Postgres. Uh, the second reason is, is that they have applications, sometimes packaged applications, a lot of times Oracle's applications that will always wind up running on Oracle. And what they wanna do is they really wanna go into a data warehouse in uh, a data lake type environment with that data into Postgres because setting that up into an Oracle environment is more Oracle licenses and they don't wanna have to spend all that additional money to set it up. So two different scenarios. So the first one we're gonna go through is, is somebody who just basically wants to set up and replicate a group of tables from Oracle or whole Oracle database and replicate it into Postgres. So first thing is, is setting up a source uh, and target is very, very easy. Like for the Oracle, it's nothing that you would think out of the ordinary. It's the host, the port, the service you're going after, the username and password. And that's pretty much it. Now, there's a lot of advanced features that you can get into uh, about schema evolution, your lag objectives for performance, parallelization, all that stuff. And you can also even set a custom change data capture position should you need to grab data out of Oracle, but you don't want everything, what you wanna do is you wanna start at a starting point, an SCN within Oracle. So if Oracle had 20 years worth of data and you really wanna start your data warehouse or your new application with just the last five years worth of data, you could give an SCN, okay? So what we're gonna do is, is uh, you know, that's very easy. Uh, we can do the same thing on the targets itself. We can come over here. We can look at, say, the Postgres target here. And you can see it's the host, the port, 
username, password, the database, and the schema, the default schema we're going after. So the first thing is, is I've got Oracle, and I want to just replicate it straight in, easy, simple, as quick as possible over to Postgres. The easiest way to do that is to add a replication group. All you do is you click, on, click add for the replication group there or replication group over here on the left-hand side. So we'll just add a replication group. I'm just gonna call it RG1. And uh, I'm gonna select my source being Oracle. And I'm gonna select my target to be Postgres. And I'm gonna put it in the public schema. Now, how do I know what I'm gonna get out of the Oracle? Well, we do it through table pattern matching. So I can click plus to add a table pattern and I can have as many of these as I want. I can select all and I would replicate everything out of that Oracle database. I can select none. And in this case, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna select the schema OT and I'm gonna come over here and I'm gonna do everything percent and I can include or exclude. So at this point, I can say generate the list. And what it will do is it will generate me a list of 15 tables, okay? Now I notice there's a couple in here that I really don't want. Now I can, I can get rid of those just by clicking and they go over here. I'm gonna put them back in just to show you, I can come up here to the pattern uh, matching. I can add another pattern matching, same schema, the OT schema, and I'm gonna do EQ percent and this time I'm going to exclude it. Now I had 15 tables, I'm gonna generate the list. Now I've got 13 tables. So these are the 13 tables that I want to basically replicate into Postgres. So all I do is I click validate table. It will go through, it will notify me of any validation issues. And this checks <coughs> privileges and uh, capabilities within the target. It also checks to see what's being done with the current replication to make sure you're not going to step on each other uh, without you knowing about it. And at this point, I can say create. When I create, I see my replication group one get created here. If I come over to the replication group, you can see each one of these are getting created as we go along. And uh, what it will do is, is it will tell us that basically all these replications are now working. So if I go over to dBeaver here, okay, and I go down to my Postgres here, uh, yeah, my Postgres in my public, and I refresh my schema, I can now see these tables are over here. So if I go to orders, and I go to the data, the data is over here already. Now I can sort the data, so I'm sort it. Okay, and order ID 3053 is the last order ID that's in there. So I just, in a matter of just a couple of minutes, started replicating, did the initial capture and started replication for 15, 13 tables right, in for Oracle to Postgres. Now I'm gonna go over here and I'm gonna start updating the Oracle tables, right? So yeah, that should start updating the Oracle tables. And if I come over here to dBeaver and the last one was 3053, now I'm at 3056. So all the data is getting pushed across as we're doing the replication. So, um, I hope that uh, helps you out a little bit. Uh, it's pretty easy to come over here. You can see the replication group. You can see the data. Uh, the Qualum platform it tells you exactly what's going on, what it's capturing and all as we go across. <clears throat> now, that's the first thing, right? Now, I can switch over to the classic view, right? And I can take any one of these that I've got here and if I want to, I could actually update it. Uh, right now, I'm, uh, this is published, which means I'm on version one, it's published. I cannot edit it, but I can click edit and I'll get version two. And on version two, I can come in here and I can choose an operator and I can do a transformation and I can basically start doing transformations right here on the fly. 
if I wanted to. So it's even though it's a very simple generation of source to target, I can come back and upgrade those at a later time. Now, if I want to, what we'll do is we'll come in. This is the classic view, okay? Within here, uh, I've got a, uh, I've got, I've got one running right now, right? That uh, is basically taking some order information, um, order items, looking up, adding product information to it, joining it, and transforming it. In the uh, Qualum platform, anytime you click on preview at this point, uh, what it's doing is, is it's actually building a job, submitting it to Spark, Spark's running it against the Kafa topic and bringing the information back. And I don't know if any of you have ever played around with Spark and all, but count how long it takes to actually look at this data on 1001, 1002, in about two seconds. We've created a job, submitted it to Spark, ran it in Spark, and then returned it. And Spark's looked it up in Kafa, grabbed the data out of Kafa, and brought it back to us. Uh, for anybody who's ever played with Spark, they're going to go, oh, wow, that's fast. Normally it takes me 20 seconds just to get the job started in Spark. So I've got orders. I've got order items. I've got lookups here. So what I'm doing is, is I'm actually joined based on the product key and getting the product name, things of that nature. Uh, I've actually joined the two tables together and I've joined these two tables on order ID. And for anybody who's ever played around with streams, you know that the data is not always guaranteed to be at the exact right time. So you need to put some kind of windowing. In this case, I did five minute windowing functions. So uh, you know, I, within five minutes, I'm assuming everything's going to be within the same uh, span. And then transformations, you can do all kind of transformations in Equalum against your data. So you can change the type, you can add additional columns. In this case, I did the length of a concatenation and also used one of our user defined functions called greet me. So if you do need to write code, you can create your own user defined functions. Plus also you can write code in pre and post processes if you need to for something special. <coughs> so in this case, this uh, workflow is actually going out and writing into a Kafa topic at the current time. <clears throat> now, if I want to, I can come in here, edit this flow, and now I'm on version two. <clears throat> I can delete my target and come back over here, add another target, and I can point it to Postgres this easy. I now edit where I want it to go in Postgres, right? So I can say I want it to go into the Qualum schema and I can say generate the create table statement. And instead of this, I'm just going to call this the uh, pre pre-order item info. Okay. And if you'll notice, it, it, it creates the table. It does the grants, everything else and I can execute it. And at this point, I have now created the table within uh, Postgres for us to load into. And there's our pre-order item. And I can go to mapping. I can do a couple of things. One is, is I can, uh, you know, change around. Uh, what, what we're doing. In this case, uh, I can change the mapping if I need to and the type that it is. But in this case, I'm just going to say, okay. I'm going to say, okay. I'm going to save it and then publish it and execute it. And, oh. <laughs> And I did one thing wrong. And I am going to go to my flow executions here. And I'm going to pause it. I'm going to resume it. And I'm going to reprocess all the events. 
And what that will do is, is that will give me my uh, initial capture again, pushing all the data into Postgres because I had pushed it earlier into uh, uh, the uh, Kafka topic. And so in this case, we will be pushing it in now. And you can see that it did the initial capture and then went to the change data capture. So it would come back over to dBeaver and we go to the equalum schema and we go to our pre-order item table there's all the information that we brought across from the the new schema changing it pointing to kafa pointing it directly into postgres and as you can tell you can do any numbers of uh of transformations and changes that you would like to do so within the qualum some of the good things is, is we have our complete metrics, which will actually come in and it will tell you what's going on. Uh, it's, you know, our metrics are being populated into Prometheus and then are being consumed and displayed through Grafana. And for all you folks who know Prometheus and Grafana, you know that pretty much anybody can grab Prometheus uh, metrics. And Grafana has its own dashboards that you can create. So if someone doesn't like the standard dashboards we provide, they can always define and grab their own uh, dashboards and do whatever they want to. As you can see down here in the user topics, you can see uh, what was going on in each and every user topic within uh, the Kafka platform. So this is all of our event stream data coming in. This is what we're doing at the current time. Uh, and if I go in there, you can actually see a little bit more of what's going on. You can see all the RG1 topics that we have and things of that nature. Uh, and it's really good because what we do is, is we give you not only Kafa but the agents which are actually collecting the information so that you can see what they're doing with their change data capture throughputs and things of that nature, their overall throughputs, so forth. And um, same thing with our flows, streams, targets, all the information is collected and displayed. And then of course, within the notifications, you can set up notification rules. Uh, you can set up uh, like this is a notification room on the target when it's a warning or critical, email myself, right? Uh, when I have a flow with a tag of orders on it, on anything, I want you to basically notify orders at aqualum.io. Uh, and they're real easy to do. All you do is click on the notification tab, uh, the replication group, it will get any kind of warnings or whatever. So if I get anything on the replication groups, I want it to, if it's a warning or critical, I want it to email me. I don't care about info. And that's how easy it is to set up. So one of the problems that, that I've seen all my life putting databases in everything else is, is usually had to go and um, develop another pack or buy another package to actually monitor and do anything with it. Uh, you know, just uh, ask Mark uh, Benioff about uh, writing patrol uh, on his, on his, uh, hiatus from Oracle and uh, then turning that and eventually getting to salesforce.com. But uh, you know, you, you got to do these things and they have to be monitored and the equal and platform installs all the components, manages all the components and gives you full graphical interface to it. As you can tell from the top, we're displaying a lot of the Prometheus inf uh, metrics and all. Uh, we're doing this through Java about CPU load, memory utilization, space usage, and so forth. But you also notice on each one of the tabs uh, or um, cards here, like on flow executions, we've got 14 streaming executions running at the current time. We've got none of them pending, we've got none of them paused, and we've got none of them in error. On the batch, you can see we've got none of them active, none queued. We had four successful in the last 24 hours and had three that failed in the last 24 hours. And same way with the sources and targets. I got five sources active, none pending or paused. And same way with the targets, six of them active and paused. Okay. Uh, so 
the other thing is alert management. Okay, uh, we try to display in each one of the locations you're in, but there's an alert management. And what it'll do is, is it will tell you the information, right? See here, my target snowflake. And uh, this is uh, because I'm running on a single node because uh, uh, I'm not in high availability node. So I get a warning because of the process uh, telling me that it's not. So you can see each one of these things are highlighted for you. And like I said, you know, you can click on the alerts within each individual area and you can just say, acknowledge all and what it will do is acknowledge them and remove them. Okay. I know I went through a lot of this stuff really fast, but I uh, wanted to make sure I had plenty of time for questions and answers at the end of the session. So real easy to set this up. It's real easy to monitor. I don't know if any of you've looked at moving stuff from Oracle into Postgres, but if you have, you know, uh, you move the data, but then the real problem comes the continuous feed from the Oracle side over into the Postgres side. And uh, that's where you got to run out and grab some more tools or write a lot of code. And uh, then you get into the problem with the restarting and guaranteeing nothing gets dropped. And that's where we come in. We handle all that. We make it simple, easy, uh, you know, very, very manageable. It does not take a, a high level of coding skills in order to be able to do this process. Okay, we got a few questions um, that have just come in. Um, guys, keep them coming. So the first is, how will metadata get copied to Postgres from Oracle? Uh, depends on what you mean by metadata, right? So the, the DDL of the original create table, uh, we do automatically for you, or like you saw uh, when I changed it from Kappa to Postgres, it generated the create table statement. And I can modify that to any method I need to before I execute it. But when you, when you create a flow, like uh, pre-order info here. Uh, when, you, when you create these flows, well, we'll take one of the RG ones here. Uh, when you create these flows and all, and you look at them, one of the things that you do is, is you set up, uh, even in the source, what you wanna do with the DDL that comes in, right? So in the case of this one by default, under advanced, by default, uh, I have three choices that I can do. And this is where I get my choices every time. I can do, do nothing with the DDL. Don't evolve the, the schema. I can evolve the schema to the stream of data, but not anywhere else. And then I manually have to take care of whatever's going on. Or the last one, which you probably want to do in the case of just doing straight old replication, right? From source to target, you want to do end to end schema evolution so that whenever I add a new column in the Oracle table, it would automatically add the column in the Postgres table. And it would then automatically take those new changes with that column and populate that new column in Postgres. And that's what you would more than likely want to do in your replication. So that it's, it's easy to set up by default, but it's also very overridable based on the workflow that you're working on. Great. So the next one is when migrating from Oracle, will this outperform their Golden Gate CDC tool? Uh, yeah. Um, in the release that I'm running right now, the, this particular release, we're using LogMiner to read the Oracle log, okay? Uh, our new release, which will be out this week, uh, which our customers won't be on for a little while, but uh, it's releasing this re release, uh, reads the Oracle redo log binary, just like Golden Gate has been reading it for years. And so at that point, it will be the same performance as the Golden Gate change data capture. Great, and I have one more right here. 
The GUI abstracts away the Spark code for ETL processing. What if I need to run some custom PySpark transformations? Does it allow me to do this? Uh, yeah, you can. You can uh, basically, when we were in this process here and we're in the transformation, right? Uh, when I come in here, I can basically, in the functions that I've got, I've got custom code. I can write anything I want to here uh, and put it in Java or JavaScript and drop it in as a user defined function. And then I can call it for every single thing that I want to do. So I can do it through the Java interface here. There's also pre and post processing that I can do before I start processing the data or after I start processing the data, uh, depending on what I need to accomplish. Uh, and there's uh, probably a couple of other ways that you can do it, but uh, uh, those are the easiest ones to do right out of the box. Yeah, there's no way that an off-the-shelf package will have proprietary algorithms, especially when you look at like uh, banking and you look at insurance companies and even tr stock trading and all. Uh, there's no way that anybody's going to be able to get all their proprietary algorithms because otherwise they wouldn't be proprietary. So you have to have a way for people to have those proprietary algorithms and be able to put them in for the transformations for like customer ratings and rankings, credit scores, all that kind of stuff. So uh, there, there's plenty of places to do that. Fantastic. So with that, I just want to thank you, Alton, um, for spending this time with us. And um, I want to thank all of you for spending your mornings or afternoons or evenings, wherever you are, uh, with another Postgres conference webinar. So um, enjoy the rest of your days, and I hope to see you on the next one. Thank you.